Hi, I'm David Ireland. In this episode of The Wildlife Man, we will explore the interior of Australia, a place the Aboriginals call the land of the dreaming. We will encounter animals that you have never seen before. So come with me on my latest Wildlife Man adventure into the land of the dreaming. Around 16 million years ago, this whole area of the Warrumbungle Mountains was a volcanic hotspot. Volcanoes pushed their way up through the Earth's surface. And then molten rock and lava would come up through the core of the volcano and through different vents and solidify and block them, becoming like plugs, a little bit like the cork in a champagne bottle. Eventually, over millions of years, erosion took place and then all that is left is these volcanic plugs. These ancient mountains are honeycombed with countless caves to explore. I'm searching for rare predators of spiders. But it may take a few days to find one. Sometimes the little creatures are just as exciting as the larger animals. And what we have here is an animal that is a master of ambush. A creature that can literally blend into its environment and camouflage itself so well that it's almost impossible to see. What we have here in this cave is a leaf-tailed gecko. Let's have a close look at this creature. If I touch him, he will use this little leaf-like tail and wave it around as if he's blowing in the wind. They mostly ambush things like little cockroaches, beetles, moss that get up in these caves, and especially spiders. These little lizards are one of the very few lizards on the planet that can vocalise. And there he goes again, barking. The Warrumbungal Mountains are blessed with high rainfall. Flooded creeks allow a rich diversity of creatures to thrive here. However, their presence attracts some dangerous predators. Fella. Now this is the red belly black snake and you can see that by these wonderful red bands that run down his tummy. What a gorgeous creature. These red belly black snakes are part of the black snake family in Australia and they are a venomous snake. In fact there have been fatalities from bites from this incredible animal. It's interesting Australian venomous snakes because they can have a cocktail of venom. They can have myotoxins which damage the muscle tissue and vital organs. They can have neurotoxins which damage the nerve endings in the lungs and heart. 
and they can also have toxins which damage the actual blood structure in our bodies, causing either hemorrhaging or clotting. So that cocktail of venom can be very, very dangerous to humans. These beautiful red-bellied snakes are hunters of frogs. They're excellent swimmers. They can even attack fish, but they'll also take mice and small birds. Beautiful, beautiful snakes. But I've got to be very careful holding this animal at the back of the head like that because their jaws are so flexible, they can actually twist and turn and grab hold of my finger very easily. Now, I'm gonna let this one go, but I might do something that you'll find very interesting. I'm gonna show you how clever these red-bellied black snakes are at swimming. So we're just gonna drop him in the creek just down here and watch him swim. And go. Now we travel westwards into the Macquarie Marshes, wetlands that are home to endangered water birds. Gorgeous little baby geese here on the edges of the road here. So I'm going to put this little bloke back in the reeds. But these water birds, they need the Macquarie marshes and they need the water. They need this environment. So too much irrigation, too much draining of the Macquarie marshes and we'll lose the precious little animals like this, the geese, these beautiful water birds. Now you go back in in there with your family. In you go. In you go. Good on you. We'll get that little one off the road. And let's keep going. Walking the edge of the marshes, I encounter an extremely rare amphibian. A toxic creature gotcha. we have never filmed before. Uh -huh. Now this is something very, very special. Look at this. This is a crucifix frog. And these animals get their name from the cross on their back. You can see the little cross on their back. The bright green, that iridescent green, tells birds, hey, I'm toxic. Because these guys can secrete a toxic fluid from pores on their back. <laughs> Come here. So I've got to be a bit careful handling him because I don't want that, that toxic fluid in my skin. Now these are wonderful creatures because these are burrowing frogs. They burrow deep into the earth during harsh times. Sit still, sit still. And they burrow down where it's nice and wet. When we get rain like we've had now, they work their way back to the surface and then they go crazy because they're so hungry. So they feed mostly on insects. And then they've got one thing on their mind, and that's making love. Making lots more of these burrowing little crucifix frogs. You're a funny, fat little thing, aren't you? Oh, come here. And I think that big, fat tummy indicates that you've either got a belly full of eggs or a belly full of grasshoppers. I'm not sure which. We'll let this little guy go. Another wonderful creature that you find in the wet marshes of Macquarie Marshes. Oh, don't hop, don't hop. Come on, I'll let you go. There you are. Off you go, you funny little thing. Sadly, large areas of the marshes are not getting flooded by the rivers anymore. The high water dependent cotton industry is blamed for this shocking situation.
but thankfully some native animals can be seen in the distance. I'll show you a little trick that I learnt from an Aboriginal mate, and that's how to get really close to wild emu. See how we go. This is a large male emu. Because the males incubate and raise the chicks, they can be territorial and deliver lethal kicks if they feel threatened. But I'm using an old Aboriginal trick. By pretending to peck at the bushes, he believes I'm feeding and not a threat. Using this method, he relaxes and allows me to get extremely close. He even permits me to follow him as he walks along the banks of a small creek. His coloration camouflages him perfectly in the Australian bush. long legs allow him to cross the creek without getting his feathers wet. After a long walk back to my truck, I'm keen to launch my canoe and explore a creek that flows through the Macquarie Marshes. These creeks and rivers that crisscross outback New South Wales and Queensland are just like the arteries and veins in your arm. The lifeblood of the Australian outback is water. If we pump too much water from these creeks and rivers for irrigation, then wilderness will suffer. We could literally bleed this country to death. We have to be so careful that we allow these rivers to flow. Now this old dead tree has got me intrigued because we can see a large slab of bark has been cut away. Now what's happened here, when the Aboriginals first came into this country, they tracked up and followed the rivers. After a while, a tribe would establish a territory. To mark that territory, they cut large slabs, usually with a stone axe, of bark from a tree like this one. A prominent tree right on the riverbank. Then they'd colour in the naked trunk with white clay and then mark it with ochre, often hand prints, or sometimes their totem, which might be a drawing of a goanna or an emu or a snake. Now, if another tribe came along this river and they saw this border tree, they would know that if they continued up into this country, they risked being speared or even killed. Very interesting. This old dead tree has got some secrets to tell. These precious waterways are infested by introduced carp that threaten native fish with extinction.
Now this is a European carp. They were introduced to Australia and they've spread all through the outback rivers, lakes and dams. And the way they spread is their eggs are sticky and they stick to the legs of water birds. So when water birds fly from one water source to another, they spread these horrible European carp. Because they grub in the, the mud for crustacea and worms, they stir up the mud and they make the environment impossible for native fish like yellow belly and cod. So they're a major, major threat to our native fish. A big, big problem. There is a guy in Queensland that makes these fish into fertiliser and sadly that's all they're good for. Horrible European carp. Now we travel further westward into the land of the dreaming where only the toughest creatures survive. got a real problem now because we're driving into a dust storm. The dust is so thick it's reducing visibility. So hopefully we can get out of the dust as well as this terrible wind. This is a king brown and these snakes are part of the black snake family. These guys are the muscle snakes. They're strong, powerful animals. He can be very, very aggressive if I upset him. Just gently lift you up. Gently lift you up. I'm not going to hurt you. Just drop my hat, I think. Bring you over here. It's all right, mate. Just be gentle. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to hurt you. Here we are. I've got you now. Here we are. Look at that, a king brown. Now the reason these guys are so dangerous for humans is because what they do when they bite, they hold on really tight and they actually chew and pump the venom in and they pump large quantities of venom into their victims, 150 milligram or more. So even though they're not as potent, the venom, as an inland taipan, it's the volume, the sheer volume of venom that's the problem for humans. The other problem with these snakes is they like to hunt things like mice and rats. And this brings them into contact with people because these guys will go into the farmhouse, into the barn. And that's the problem, especially with children. It's a dangerous snake for that reason. And it's a good idea to use a professional wrangler to remove them rather than try and kill them with a shovel. What a magnificent animal, look at him. Hello mate, aren't you something, eh? Aren't you something? Whoop. Uh, 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 uh. We're not quite finished with you yet. I'll let you go in a minute. So there he is, the King Brown. What a beautiful thing. We'll let you go now, mate. Off you go. Some reptiles escape the heat by burrowing into the sand. You'd be a good boy. <laughs> I just love these creatures. I really do. This is a goanna or a sand monitor. And they're such specialised hunters. Wonderful Australian creature. I'll tell you a few stories about these animals. Firstly, have a look at the coloration. Look at that. 
you can see how hard they would be to see. They're perfectly camouflaged. If I hold him up in this tree here, this bush, they just disappear. Look at that. You never find them, never see them. These animals are hunters of basically anything they can catch and get down that throat. But it's an interesting fact about these animals, which is new scientific knowledge. And that is that recently they have found or discovered that inside that mouth is a very basic venom mechanism. It's a little bit like a little, a little bag full of venom that they chew into their victim. So when they bite something, the animal gets bacteria from the teeth as well as a mild form of venom, which is quite lethal combination. When they want to fight for the rights to a female or a territory, the males stand up on their back legs like that and they wrestle each other and try and force the other one down. The strongest one will win the territorial rights of an area and he will be the one that gets the females. Now, do you want me to put you back in your burrow? Yes. <laughs> All right, we'll let you go. Feral goats thrive in this harsh environment by feeding on a huge variety of vegetation. Nannies often have twins. A tiny herd can expand to hundreds in a few years, putting enormous pressure on available food for kangaroos and wallabies. Without sufficient food, female kangaroos reproduce less often. Graham Wellings owns the pub at White Cliffs, an opal mining town. He helped purchase the hotel by rounding up feral goats. When I first started out, I mustered 60,000 in the first three months within, within 40 mile of White Cliffs. 60,000 goats. And you did that with a plane? Yes, mainly because of steep hill country and it was too steep for horses and dogs to get into. Right. And the goats had never had a plane on them and they used to walk out six and eight thousand at a time. What's the chance of you taking us up in the plane and we get a few shots of the, of the mines from the air? I'd love to take you up. It's great to see from the air. The only thing is today it's pretty windy, it's dusty, it's going to be very bumpy down low. Opals were first found here back in 1884. Over a hundred years of mining has left the area like a moonscape. I know we will find something interesting in those dangerous shafts. Wow, this is really serious four-wheel driving because we are actually taking our car between the mine shafts. And there's not much room between them. And I don't want to drop our beautiful car down into a mine shaft and kill us all. So we've got to be very careful going through this place. We're going to have a look at some of these shafts. This one here, I'll see if I can climb into it with the lights and we'll see what we can find. Deep inside this mine shaft. It's a bit scary in here because I just don't know how much weight these rocks will support before they collapse down into that mine shaft further. Now what's happened here is a red kangaroo has fallen down into the shaft and in this incredibly dry environment, it's become mummified. Just amazing, look at this. Oh, how frightening. You see the claws, 
teeth of the skull, the rib cage. It looks like something you would find in an Egyptian tomb. Now, I don't want to be mummified in one of these old mine shafts, so I think I might leave this guy in peace and get out of here. See you later, mate. Rest in peace. Wow, what have we found here? Now, this is a very interesting place here because this part of the mine, you can actually walk into the shaft, which means animals can walk in and also walk back out again. What we've found is hundreds and hundreds of feral goat skeletons. What I believe is happening here is when the animals are old and sick, they come in here to die. Now here's one of these skulls here. Look at that. That's obviously a billy, a big male. <laughs> Just incredible. There's skulls everywhere. Here's another one, look at that. So what a complicated thing this is because we're starting to realise that when animals get sick and get old, they like to go to a certain place to die. In this case, an old mine shaft. Might be time to go. Creatures have to be tough to survive in the interior of Australia. The dangers are very real out here. Intense heat, lack of shelter and water, and the chance of an encounter with the most toxic serpents on the planet. Now I have to be extremely careful with working this species of snake because this is the inland taipan. The neurotoxic venom in this snake is more potent than any snake on the planet. This guy is number one. I have to be so careful with this one. Put my head down. Now holding this guy by the tail is dangerous because that head is so light and so small they can bite the face of the man that holds the tail. Settle down, settle down. These snakes are ambushes especially of warm-blooded animals. Creatures like bush rats and birds. These incredible snakes, these taipans, will normally slither away quickly from bushwalkers. But if they're cornered or they feel threatened, they will strike and deliver an awesome amount of incredibly toxic venom that can easily take me out. This is only a young one. Oh. Settle down, mate. Settle down. Look at this beautiful thing. The outback can change quickly. After an overnight storm, yesterday's thirsty kangaroos are hopping in chest deep water. Our searching for animals is rewarded with an encounter of a lifetime. Now, one of the most exciting experiences that I can have is to bring you an animal that up to only a few years ago was considered to be extinct. This gorgeous little creature is a dunart, which is the tiniest marsupial, that's pouched animal, in the world. These little guys are carnivorous, so they have sharp little teeth and they hunt things like grasshoppers, spiders and scorpions but sadly, they are locally extinct in many parts of Australia. Now, the only possible way that we can allow these animals to survive in the future is to have corridors of native bush between large wilderness areas, especially national parks. With corridors, animals can migrate backwards and forwards and, of course, allow the gene pool to expand. All right, sweetheart, we'll let you go, eh? I wish you all the luck in the world, you gorgeous little creature.
ready? You're gonna race up there in the scrub? Off you go. Whoa, how fast is he? Continuing westwards, we enter the Munda Desert, where animals rely on speed and endurance to escape from predators. The red dust is kicked up by the hooves of wild brumbies. These hardy horses have adapted well to the arid conditions. Emus demonstrate their ability to also run like the desert wind. I'm trying to catch up to these emus. On the Munda Plain, we're actually tracking across the red sand. Just amazing. They're doing about 55 k's an hour. Just out here. This is... Wow. But it's hard to keep up with them on this desert, bumping around everywhere. Back in the 1800s, Afghan camel herders brought their camels to Australia to carry supplies across the arid wilderness. With the development of rail and road transport, camels became obsolete and many were released or escaped into the desert. Now, wild camels outnumber red kangaroos 100 to 1 in some areas. And wild camels pose horrific problems for desert vegetation. Walking onto a wild bull is not without risk. A 700 kilogram camel can easily stomp a man to death. Understanding the body language of these magnificent beasts is critical for my own survival. With a close-up footage achieved, it's time to give this unpredictable giant some space. We stop and an extremely remote pub in the desert and meet Diane, the owner. How long have you been here now? This is my eighth year. Eighth year, yes. And you've filled up this hotel with all sorts of interesting things. Yes, there's sewing machines and old radios, old records. Frill neck lizards. Frill neck lizards and old chooks. <laughs> old chooks. <laughs> all sorts of stuff. Now, Manny Hill has a population of, of seven. Of seven. Seven people. So here we are in Manny Hill Hotel. This little tiny town has only got a population of seven people. It gives you an idea of some of these incredible little tiny towns in central Australia. After days of driving, we have finally arrived at the foothills of the Flinders Ranges. We're rewarded with countless numbers of corellas feeding on the grass seeds. The Aboriginals called Australia the land of the dreaming. We meet up with my old friend Kelvin. He's an Aboriginal elder. He's taken us to a secret Aboriginal site where Aboriginals came from many parts of Australia to engrave animals into the rocks. How they found this place is a complete mystery. This may be the most extensive engraving site in the world. 
with engravings that have never been filmed before. What's so fascinating about this amazing place, this red gorge here in the Flinders Ranges, is that there are so many different species of animals that the Aboriginals have engraved into the rocks. And these engravings date back so many thousands and thousands of years. And it shows the bond, the connection between man and animal, between Aboriginal and wildlife. Now here is further evidence that Aboriginals came here from different parts of Australia because this engraving is a box jellyfish. That's the head of the animal and the long, trailing, stinging tentacles, which are deadly, of course, to humans. What happened is Aboriginals from the tropical north that know these creatures like box jellyfish have come down into these mountains of the Flinders. They've tracked up these rivers, come here for trade and for ceremonies, chiselled away creatures from their part of Australia. In this case, a box jellyfish. And there's certainly no box jellyfish normally here in the Flinders Ranges. So when you come up to this very, very special place you've brought me, how do you feel knowing that for thousands of generations of your people, came from here, you come from this special place. How do you feel when you're here? Well, I feel I'm with my ancestors while I'm here. Yeah. And I know I'm safe. And you feel safe? Yep. There are precious little animals living amongst the rocks here. Now here we have the most gorgeous creature, a little fat-tailed gecko. And these little fellas live here in these rocks in Red Gorge. The beauty about this animal is there are engravings of this little gecko here. Now he looks like he's been painted by Aboriginals, but actually he's been painted by nature. A chain of caterpillars migrate across the rocks searching for food. Their needle-sharp, poisonous hairs protect them from hungry birds. Kelvin shows me an Aboriginal site of sharp stones. Tell me about this little Aboriginal site here. Well, this not only this site, this site is around us here. Yep. Aboriginal people used to camp through this area. You'll see a campfire as well. So the Aboriginals camped along this creek? They camped along this creek because there was water and uh, tucker through yep. here. And the reason they stayed here because of the painting. Sure, they and of course you've got fresh water here. Water. That attracted the kangaroos, That's there's right. plenty of tucker. Yep, yep. and uh, the, the reason why the these stones are lefty because every people left them here because that's what they used before the white man brought the uh, knife in. So they used these as a cutting tool? Cutting tool, yep. And they're quite sharp little rocks. And I can see this one's been struck. You can see pieces have been taken off. Taken yep. off. Yep. It's very, very sharp. So they use these for cutting, cutting meat and also meat. Skinning, kangaroos. skinning kangaroo. They use it for anything else? Mm -hmm. Use it for stroking sides. They use they these the to circumcise. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who the guy was that was sitting here with one of these sharp little rocks and thought to himself, I know what I can do with this. I can circumcise somebody with it. And then that painful experience and concept spread throughout all over Australia. Yeah, yep. All the men got circumcised with little rocks. And then the concept spread all over the world. So we can thank the Aboriginals for being circumcised. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would not want to be circumcised with that little rock. What about that one? No, not that one either. <laughs> <laughs> Is 
I'm happy to show Kelvin's grandchildren some of my Wildlife Man films. One day, the health of the natural world will be in the hands of our children. <laughs> I'm now keen to explore wilderness seldom visited by man high in the mountains of the Gammon Ranges. Natural springs bubble here from the earth and prehistoric creatures still survive. Hello, darling. Hello, you big fat thing. Oh. You come and meet my friends. Now, what we have here is something very, very special. This is Taliqua rigosa, which is actually a shingleback lizard. An amazing creature. Now, the first thing you notice with these animals is look at the tail now hold him up carefully. Sorry about being upside down. Look at the tail and look at the head. The concept being, if something comes down to try and kill this animal, it doesn't know which is the head and which is the tail. In fact, it might even have two heads. So it's a bit frightening. This is a very ancient lizard. The interesting thing about these animals is they are omnivorous, which means they eat plant matter, like flowers, and also invertebrates. They even take things like snails. But look at the coloration of this very fat lizard. See that dark black scales on the tummy and on the back. And these animals are very special because what they do is when they partner up, they stay with their partner for life. And that could be 30, 40 or more years. And we'll let this beautiful thing go now. Okay. We'll put you back on your rock. Here we are, darling. Careful of these nippers now. Whoa, you're a bit nasty, aren't you? You're a bit nasty. Gotcha. Gotcha. I think we've got another one here. We have. Let's wash the algae off. Aha! Two freshwater crayfish. Or what they call in the outback yabbies. When I think of Burke and Wills that came into the interior of Australia and eventually died of starvation, it amazes me because they were literally surrounded by bush tucker. If they only knew how to find it. These creatures live in these little creeks and springs that come bubbling out of the mountains. And there's hundreds of them and they're not hard to catch because the water's so shallow. Beautiful animals to eat, and they'd certainly save your life in the bush if you were hungry. And I think I might eat you. I'm going to eat you. Am I? No, I won't eat you. I'll let you go. <laughs> Back you go. There you are. Be careful of the birds. Be careful of the birds, you guys. Sadly, even here, feral goats have penetrated and compete for available vegetation with native animals. But hardy mountain kangaroos, called euros, tenaciously survive.
As the sun heats the jagged rocks, they come to the mountain springs to quench their thirst. These Euros may never have seen man before. I'm going to try and get within touching distance of a completely wild mountain kangaroo. By crawling, I don't show the silhouette of a man. Instincts dictate that men are dangerous. The Euro is not regarding me as a predator. As I get closer, I pretend to drink by gently splashing the water with my fingers. Aboriginals have taught me the skills that allow me to get extremely close to wild animals. We are achieving documentary history by getting within touching distance of a wild mountain kangaroo. We spend so much time canoeing, hiking, forward driving and swimming to bring you the animal encounters of the Wildlife Man series. And I promise you there's nothing I like more than to bring the wilderness into your lounge room. How you going, old timer? David Island's the name. We've been out here doing a wildlife man film. Done a lot of miles, I tell you. Oh, we've done heaps. We've caught some big snakes, seen some real pretty country. Yeah. You lived out here long, have you? Been out here a long time, haven't you?